the adult Sunday school lesson from the NAS on North Lake. <clears throat> this lesson was prepared for June 5, 2022, and it is the first lesson from the first unit of our summer quarterly titled Hebrews. Now, if you guess that the lesson will be from the book of Hebrews, you were right. Superiority is a major theme in the book of Hebrews. In fact, the Greek words for better and superior occur 15 times throughout the letter. In most cases, these words compare Christ and his work to the key figures of the Old Testament. <clears throat> in addition to angels, Jesus is proclaimed to be greater than the prophets, Moses, Joshua, the human high priest, and the old covenant sacrifices. The title of today's lesson uh, is Such a Great Salvation, with the subtitle, Christ is the Ultimate Revelation of God and of God's Great Salvation for Us. Last week, we discovered the significance of opening our eyes to opportunities where we can be the hands and feet of Christ in our world. By the end of today's lesson, we want to understand that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection completed God's plan for, of salvation for his people. We want to know that Jesus Christ provides us with the final and complete revelation of God so that we will never even think of giving allegiance to any other means of salvation. Our scripture for today is Hebrew 1 1, Hebrews 1 1 through 2 4. Now, we're going to jump right in here without a anything much more uh connect into my experience well let's think about angels for a couple of minutes angels appear in movies in books on merchandise such as jewelry and knickknacks on t-shirts and so on we could find lots of places we see angels there is no shortage of reference to angels in the Bible. The word angel can be found in 34 of the 66 books of the Bible. And the word angel appears a total of 305 times. <clears throat> so what helps lead us to how we view angels? Well, I started out and saying, hopefully the Bible does, but, uh, Maybe some other things do too. Maybe some shows and movies on television or in a theater. How about books we read? Maybe we've even seen angels in works of art. For some reason, some people think that when they die, they become an angel and play a harp while sitting on a cloud. I don't understand where they get that idea, but anyway. Um, now, the next instruction in the lesson material is to list as many biblical and outside references and descriptions of angels as you can. Well, I'm not going to follow those instructions. I'm just going to jump, move on to the next question here. And the next question is, how do you picture angels and their roles? I believe there are many different spiritual beings created by God for various purposes that fall into the general category of angels. From scripture, we know that some have wings. In fact, some have six wings. We also know that some can appear just like a human because we are told we might meet one and not even know it. We know that there are guardian angels and warrior angels, and there's mission, messenger angels. And they we could probably even come up with a, a 
few more, you know, uh, that we know about. Now, we do need to remember that the Bible treats angels as part of the created order. They stand with humans as created beings in contrast to God, the creator. We should not become superstitious and attribute glory to angels. Glory belongs to God alone. Angels do God's work and have been given some special authority by God. But Jesus Christ's authority far surpasses theirs, and they serve him. I believe God sends angels to watch over us and protect us sometimes. And we are usually completely unaware that that is happening. And many of the things that we interface with angels, we probably don't even know about or understand. So transition here. Hebrews doesn't shy away from clarifying one major thing about these mysterious beings we call angels. They are not on par with Jesus. These biblical messengers are important servants of God, but they don't hold a candle to the only one who can reveal God's greatness and God's greatest message to us. That one is his son, Jesus. So we're going to connect into the word here. and We're starting out with um, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our people through the prophets. He spoke at many times. He spoke in different ways. But in these last days... He has spoken to us through his son. He is the only one whom God appointed to receive all things. God also made everything through him. The son is the shining brightness of God's glory. He is the exact likeness of God's being. He uses his powerful words to hold all things together. He provided the way for people to be made pure from sin. Then he sat down at the right hand of the king, the majesty of heaven. So he became higher than the angels. His name is received. The the name he received is more excellent than theirs. Well, the author of Hebrews gives us a foundation here to see how the communication and the revelation of God operated throughout the uh, course of human history. He recognizes that God has spoken through prophets and ancestors and that now God speaks through Christ, who is both the son of God and the revelation of God. So what are some examples of how God spoke through prophets and gave verbal messages before sending Jesus? Well, as I consider this question, I think back to the history of the Old Testament. You know, humans fail and their sin damaged their relationship with God. But God still had a plan for the redemption of humans who would follow his plan. The words of the prophets set the foundation for understanding, and it showed them that God had a plan. The record of their messages help us have faith because what we what he said through the prophets came true. God knew the future and he spoke it through the prophets. So how does God's communication to us through his son? How does God communicate to us through his son? Well, God gave us the Bible, which is God's word. And Jesus was uh, is the living word of God, right? And it includes the account of Jesus' life, 
death and resurrection, which speaks to us, God also gives us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to teach, guide, and empower us. God's plan also includes speaking to us through his church, where, you know, we are members of Christ's body, and Jesus is the head of the church. And through the church, he can speak to us. Why is it important to know that the Son is the exact representation of the Father? You know, for me, there is a concept that is difficult for us to understand, but is necessary for us to believe. And that is the fact that God is God, but he consists of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these have always acted in unison of purpose. The Trinity. The Son came to earth to communicate face to face with humans and fulfill God's plan. And as Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 9, when they asked him to show them the Father, Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So we can know and believe that God loved us so much, even while we were sinners, that he came to us personally 2,000 years ago. He walked the earth in a human body. Today, he walks the earth as the Holy Spirit indwells millions of Christians. So people see Christ in Christ's followers. Do people see Jesus in you? I try to live in a way that they would see Jesus in me. So how does the incredible truth of God's personal contact with us impact our faith? Well, for me, this truth cements my faith together and in place, erasing any doubts. Just think about it. The God who created everything felt that I was worth enough that he would, he willingly came to earth as a human and suffered and died on a cross so that my sins could be forgiven. He rose from the dead, making it possible that I could be reconciled to him as his child. And he dwells within me through the spirit to be my guide. And he does that for every human being if they will let him and if they will believe that he is our Lord and Savior, our teacher and our guide. You know, angels bring angels bring God's messages to people. They protect God's people. They give guidance. They carry out punishment, and they fight forces of evil. That's a pretty big job, right? Yet, Jesus is far greater than those angels. Why is it important to note that angels are created beings? Well, angels are not divine. They are created beings. And that way, they are the same as you and I. They serve God. You know, and some even rebelled against God. Think about Satan and those who joined in his rebellion. Because angels are created, they can't be as great as Jesus. Jesus is the God who created them. So Jesus is far, far superior. 
when we try to compare compare him to the angels. Now we're going to read uh, Hebrews 1 verses 5 through 14. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the, of the angels, he said, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about his son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, set at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not, are not all angels, ministering spirits, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? You know, the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels portrays him as one who's traveling the dusty roads in order to teach and heal people. We, he has, he, he was understood by the majority. No, let me back up here. He was misunderstood by the majority and was unjustly condemned to death by his enemies. But he rose again. Now, the portrait here in these verses is of a radiant, supreme, eternal, reigning God. So, first question. How do you explain or reconcile these vastly different portraits of Jesus? The teacher wandering the dusty roads and the eternal reigning God. How do we justify that? Well, I think we understand that Jesus' physical inter interaction on earth has two distinct phases. The first phase was 33 years long and took place about 2,000 years ago. At that time, the purpose of Jesus' earthly ministry was to teach and show us the Father. It also included his death for our sins and his resurrection as he defeated death. Now, now, in order to better understand the second phase, the second phase, I'm going to read part of his mother's conversation with the angels, with an angel, Gabriel, from Luke 1. 31 through 33. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high God. The Lord God will make him a king like his father David. Of long ago, the son of the most high God will rule forever over his people. They are from the family line of Jacob. That kingdom will never end. 
Now we know from last our last quarter's study of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts that God's plan was not only for the Jews who would believe, but included all people everywhere who would believe. So Jesus is coming back. He hasn't done the second phase yet. That's still the future. And we have no idea when it's going to be. I believe it's going to be in my lifetime. My lifetime's getting pretty short here, probably. Uh, but whenever he comes back, the only one who knows when he's coming, and he said he didn't even know when he was here on earth, that it was the Father was the only one who knew. So what echoes of these verses do you hear in Hebrews 1.8? We see Jesus' greatness, his identity as the Son of God, and uh, also that Jesus will be enthroned as the king of a never-ending kingdom. I'm also going to read... Uh, Hebrews 1, 5 through 14, again, here, I'm going to read that scripture. And I'm going to give a short answer to the following two questions after each verse. What does this verse say about Jesus? And what is the meaning or truth this verse for us today? I'm not going to go into a long discussion on those, just kind of a short answer. Okay, verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. So what does that verse say about Jesus? This tells us that Jesus is not an angel, right? What does this, what is the meaning or truth of this verse for us today? Angels are not God's sons. They're not divine. Verse 6, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So what does that tell the verse say about Jesus? Jesus is greater than angels, and angels are to worship Jesus. So what is the meaning or truth of this verse for us today? For me, it says that angels, but no, for me, it says that Jesus is worthy of our worship too, and we should be worshiping. If the angels are worshiping Jesus, he's worthy of our worship. Verse 7, in speaking of the angels, he said, he makes his angels spirits and servants, flames his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire so what does this verse say about jesus angels are servants of jesus what is the meaning and the truth of this verse for us today jesus can dispatch his angels to assist those who believe verse 8 but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. What does this verse say about Jesus? Jesus is God and is eternal and will rule, will rule forever with justice for all. So what is the meaning or truth of this verse for us today? We know that Jesus will always be there with us for eternity. And we can trust him with our now. Verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of glory, oil of joy, excuse me. 
What does this verse say about Jesus? Jesus loves righteousness and hates wickedness. He is above all, and God has anointed him with joy. So what is the meaning of truth of this verse for us today? For me, we need to follow his commands and do what is right. Remember one of the fruit of the spirit is joy. Verse 10. He also said, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. So what does this tell us about Jesus? Jesus was involved in creation. He was the creator. What is the meaning or truth of the verse for us today? Jesus is God and he understands all of creation, including us. The verse 11, they will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. What does this verse tell us about Jesus? The existing creation will be made new. In Revelation 6, 14, we are told, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island will re be removed from its place. So what is the meaning and the truth of this verse for us? There will be a new creation. We, as we read in Isaiah 65, 17, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Verse 12, you will roll them up like a scroll, like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. So what does this verse say about Jesus? All the new creation Jesus will, look after all the new creation, Jesus will still be the same and will never change. So what is the meaning of the truth of this verse for us today? We can trust Jesus because he is always the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we need to prepare, and he is gone to prepare a place for us. To which of the angels did Jesus ever say, set at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So what does this verse tell us about Jesus? Jesus is setting at God's right hand, and his enemies have been defeated by the Father and cannot touch him touch him. <clears throat> so what is the meaning or truth of this verse for us today? We know that Jesus is our brother and our advocate sitting beside the father. Verse 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So what does this verse tell us about Jesus? We see here that Jesus sends angels to assist those whose sins have been forgiven. So what is the meaning or truth of this verse for us today? God loves us and has a plan for us. And he will send angels to minister to us if we are his children. Okay, now we're going to read the next set of piece of scripture, the rest here, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4.
So we must pay the most careful attention to what we have heard. Then we will not drift away from it. Even the message God spoke through angels had to be obeyed. Every time people broke the law, they were punished. Every time they didn't obey, they were punished. Then how will we escape if we don't pay attention to God's great salvation? The Lord first announced this salvation. Those who heard him gave us a message about it. God showed that this message is true by signs and wonders. He showed that it's true by different kinds of miracles. God also shows that his message is true by the gifts of his, of the Holy Spirit. God gave them out as it pleased him. Well, the purpose of Hebrews, of the Hebrews letter here, was to encourage the Jewish believers to remain solid in their faith. There was a danger that negative influences could lead them away from Christ. So first question, what do you think the right of men by drifting away? Well, for me, a boat without an anchor will drift away from a point under the influences of a current in the water or a breeze in the air. The writer was concerned that the Hebrew Christians might move away from Christ and his teachings if they did not pay careful attention to what they had been taught. You know, unless you uh, are a drift fish, unless you're out drift fishing, drifting is generally not an intentional thing to do. You do not want it to occur. When you're not paying attention, also, drifting generally uh, is not an abrupt movement, but is slowly moving further and further away from the point if you don't have an anchor. So why are they cautioned to pay attention to what they have heard? Well, these Christians had been taught the truth of the gospel. However, due to opposition and false teachers, or maybe because of complacency, they could drift away from what they had been taught. We know from other writings in the scriptures that there were those who still emphasized keeping the Old Testament was necessary for salvation. And this could cause people to drift away from the truth. That Jesus' death and resurrection was sufficient. So how do we avoid drifting away? I guess I could also, again here, again mention uh, this point, PRP, you know. We can remember to praise God for what he's done. We can study his word and we can talk and listen to God. We can remain faithful to God and we can live each day in obedience to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we can spend some quality time and we need to spend some quality time with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit every day. You know, throughout all of Scripture, we see humanity grappling with the stresses and the weaknesses of the flesh and the remaining <coughs> and uh, weaknesses of the flesh and of remaining faithful. There's people struggle to do that. 
Throughout that same narrative, we find God always and absolutely faithful. How does being mindful of our relationship with God and his message keep our faith strengthened? I believe we must walk with God daily. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to take a sip. <coughs> Okay, I believe we must walk with God daily and not become complacent or indifferent in our faith. Maybe it would help if we made the effort to look for all the little things that God is doing in and around us. And if we talked with other believers about that, you know, I think it could help both us and them if we took time to look for and praise God for those things that he's doing in our life, even though they're pretty minor, that we take for granted. He's always there. And remember, the angels are helpers to those who have salvation. In what ways does the Holy Spirit help us avoid drifting away? Well, you know, the Holy Spirit lives within us if we are believers. And he is our teacher and our guide. You know, when we start to read God's word, we should ask the Holy Spirit to show us something new. The Holy Spirit will help us discern what the scripture means. And he will help us see the things that are happening around us. So we're down to connecting to my life and the world portion of the, uh, of the lesson. From the fourth century onward, Christians have joined their voices with the generations that came before them and those that would come after to proclaim the tenets of our faith through creeds that are statements of what we believe. <clears throat> One of those creeds was first adopted in the year 325, and it was amended in the year 381, and it is still in use today. It is a Nicene Creed. Now, as I read this creed to you, I invite you to think about the character of God. Also, consider what words or phrases in this creed grab your attention or move your heart or maybe tap your conscience. Okay. The Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man <clears throat> and was crucified also for us on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures 
and ascended into heaven and sat on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. What thoughts came to your mind as the creed was read? This lesson is prepared for June 5th, 2022, and that is Pentecost Sunday. And there is every reason to believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us just as he spoke to those early Christians. The ministry of the Holy Spirit both enables and strengthens the believer to hold steady and to cling to the life proclaiming, the life proclaimed through the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to uh, take a couple of minutes here and silently consider the message of today's scripture. Who Jesus is and that great salvation that he has provided for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and want to thank you for loving us enough. Even when we were ignorant of you and lost in our sin nature, you loved us enough to plan a way to provide for our salvation. It was a plan that was costly to you and your son, and we want to thank you. I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit that prepared us to receive the gospel and for those men and women who followed you and taught us of your love and your son's sacrifice that our sins could be forgiven and that we could have faith in you, our faithful Lord. We also ask that you give us a special measure of your spirit to guide and guard us so that we do not drift, do not become complacent. Lord, we also continue to pray for those who need a special touch of healing and comfort. We think of Miss Consuela, Jay and Debbie, Betty, Doris, Terry, Alonzo, Sid, Leanna, and for others with unspoken concerns that 
you know, but we do not. We pray for those in ministry who are reaching out to those who need to hear the gospel and change the direction of their lives. Comfort those who have lost loved ones in Texas because of the school shoot. And those suffering around the world from wars and religious persecution. Thank you, Lord, for being with us every day. We love you. Amen. Well, that's the end of our Sunday School uh, lesson for today. And uh, we uh, pray that uh, you have a great uh, weekend, great Sunday services tomorrow. And that uh, you always remember that uh, God loves you. And uh, so do I. Have a good week.